Good evening. Uh, turn with me to Zechariah 5. Zechariah 5. Then I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, and I said, Flying roll. The length thereof is twenty cubits, and the breadth thereof ten cubits. Then said he unto me, This is a curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stilleth shall be cut off as on this side according to it, and every one that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. Now, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to come and look at your word and partake of it. Lord, we pray you anoint me, anoint your word, make it alive to us so that we can partake of it and receive what you have for us. We just thank you for the opportunity to be together and to uh, consider your word and to uh, study your word and to hear your word. And Lord, we pray you put it in our spirits as you so desire. And we just say this in your name. Amen. This is called judgment on the horizon. Now, not all of it's going to be judgment, okay? But what we see up front is a type of judgment going forth. Now, we can't go on in Zechariah 5 without noting the, that the Lord is referred to as the Lord of the whole earth. We talked about that today. If you go back there to verse 14 of 4, it says, Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord. And the way it's spelled is Adonai, which is uh, owner of the whole earth. And this is also mentioned in Psalm 97.5 in the same way in Isaiah 54.5. Now, he is owner of all, everything, okay? He is not uh, someone who just sort of lets things happen and then he steps on the scene. He is controlling everything. He is owner of everything. And what's happened is Satan has taken captive everything and put it under his systems in order for man to barter with his soul. So you might as well just lay it out that way. What, what Satan claims is, as his... He's using is God's. What man claims is his is God's. And we need to understand that because he's the owner. He is lending it to us. He may be uh, blessing us in some ways even, but it's still his. It's still his. And if we have anything, it's because he's blessed us. It's because of his grace. And, you know, some of you, if you don't believe me, go to Russia and work there and see how you fare. I don't care what kind of initiative you all have. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how many degrees you are. You're not going to get any breaks. You're going to be like everybody else. And you can say, I made it on my own. I want you to know if God did not touch, you, touch it and bless you, you wouldn't be anywhere. Because he is the owner of the whole earth. Now, he wanted them to understand this because they're looking at... So many situations and, and, and enemies and oppression that they, that's all they see. And they don't realize that those people aren't going to have the final say. God's going to have the final say. So many times we're dealing with Satan and it seems that we take maybe 10 steps ahead and, and I mean two steps ahead and 10 steps back. And that is the way it is, because we're often going against the current of the world until God steps on and puts his finger in it and, you know, gives us an open door to go forward. It is a battle, and it seems like we're just surrounded by defeat and chaos. And in most of my life, I have encountered a lot of defeat. But it's because God's preparing me to take greater steps. The greatest defeat that ever seemed to occur in the world's history was Jesus' death on the cross, and yet it was the greatest victory. And we have to remember that. Sometimes what we think is the greatest defeat is God's greatest victory. It's this opportunity to show himself in a major way. Now, as we deal with life, you know, we usually realize that 
we have this great expectation, but it's always in light of things yet to come. Uh, the reality of, of, of every day is that it's hard. It's hard sometimes. And when you're trying to make uh, advancements in the kingdom of God, it even proves harder sometimes, okay? It's just that way. You are going to meet adversity, and the reason why is God uses that, again, to fine-tune you and enlarge you. And to test your faith and see if you are going to trust him no matter what's going on. That he is still God. Now, there are so many promises, but before there's promises that can come forth, there's always judgments that will blow through the world. You know, we have the great promise of Jesus coming back again, but before that happens, there's going to be these judgments blow through the world. And there's going to be tribulation. We don't know how bad. It says bad in some areas, uh, terrible maybe in other areas. But there's this tribulation first. And then there's these promises. There's always a testing before the promise. Now you have to remember that Zechariah is talking to the Jewish people in the land of Jerusalem. And these prophecies are directed towards the Jewish people, but we as Christians are going to benefit from it. Okay, we have to understand that. But they're directed at Israel. Now, some of these visions end up to be double and triple fulfillment. Okay, and uh, you will you see that as you look backward and forward. So let's look at this, because what he's seeing is this flying roll, and it's uh, 15 feet by 30 feet. It's not a minor little thing, okay? On one side is the fact that people have been stealing. That's the eighth commandment, by the way, and it has to do with man. On the other side is an indictment, the, another indictment it, against God. That they have been using his name in vain. That's the third commandment. The third is complete, eight is new beginnings. But the problem is, is that there was tremendous amount of people swearing according to God's name and not keeping their word, not keeping their pledge. And that is using his name in vain. Now we think cussing is using his name in vain. It is, because... You know, we have no business doing that. But when you, you make, you swear on the name of God by his name and you do not carry it out, you have just used his name in vain. And that's what was happening here. Okay? And now the commandments were, the law was to the Jewish people. So he's not talking about the rest of the world. He's talking about the Jewish people and their practices. And so on one end, on one side, they're using the name in vain. On the other side, they're stealing. What are they stealing from? Now, here's a good scenario. Maybe they were making money in Babylon and not giving the money they could to the work of Jerusalem either. That would be stealing. So there could be a lot of things going on here. But it has two, they have two offenses going on here. And that one is a blatant offense against man. The other one is a blatant offense against God. Now, as you know, if you break one aspect of the law, you break the whole law according to James 2.10. Now, let's say you're out there speeding. You get a ticket. You say, well, I broke... The law. You broke the whole law, even by speeding. Because part of the law is you don't speed. And so when these people broke a commandment, they broke the whole law of God. And this is what it's all about. Now you have to remember that commandments had to do with the moral, ethical practice of people and society. Today, lawlessness abounds. <laughs> I'm sure everybody will agree. It abounds everywhere. And someone once said, the commandment for today is thou shalt get away with it. Thou shalt, get, thou shalt not get caught, is what it basically comes down to. 
The one thing that you have to understand is that the people that are trying to break the commandments are also trying to get around Satan's systems to do their own thing. And Satan has it set up that in every system there's a trap and eventually a person will fall in and he'll say, I gotcha. You're not as smart as you think you are. The Bible talks about the fact that anybody who digs a pit for others will fall into it, uh, into it themselves. Now the truth of the matter is, is that man is always trying to figure his way around what is right. And it would be so simple for him to do what is right. But you see, there's just something about that. If you do what's right, you're not doing it your way. And I want to do it my way. But you will reap what you sow and in the end you're going to be judged now if you call yourself a Christian if you call yourself God one of God's people you need to know that when you make a verbal claim it's a binding contract if you say I'm going to do this it's a binding contract if you say, I'm not going to do this, it's a binding contract. That is how, how firm your word should be. If you cannot make it a binding contract, then you don't say it at all. We have to do what we say. I'm talking about righteously. I'm not talking about wickedness. We have to do what we say, even to our own hurt. If that's what it's going to happen. Because our word needs to mean everything. Because our word is going to establish our authority and our credibility. Now you can look at some how important your word can, uh, is supposed to be. You can read it in Deuteronomy 23, 21, 23. And Psalms 39, 1. <clears throat> and Psalms 141, 3. You look those scriptures up. And it will tell you how important your word should be to you. However, there are those, and still are, who uh, would pledge or swear by God, right, and heaven concerning a matter, but have no intention of keeping it. Or somewhere along the line, fell to. And people, again, this is a form of using the Lord's name in vain if you're saying, oh, by the, you know, by the Lord, the Lord or by heaven or by whatever or the Bible, I'm going to do it. And you don't. And you've just used his name in vain. Now, the commandments were clear about not stealing and about not using the Lord's name in vain. And Jesus made this very clear. We're going to look at these. So keep your hand, and Zechariah, we're going to Matthew. We're going to look at five. Because Jesus is really trying to put the, the credibility back in what people say. And today, no one can believe anybody. Today, uh, Carrie was talking to somebody and found out somebody lied about something that, that was terrible. I mean taking credit for something they did not do. And they lied about it. And God hates liars. Liars do not make it into the kingdom of God. This is serious business. And so basically, from now on, you can't trust anything that person says. You don't know if that person has deluded themselves or if they're intending to lie, but they're a liar. They are a liar, period. And it's a sad thing uh, to, to encounter these liars because they're in trouble. So let's look at Matthew 5. Let me get there. We're going to look at 30, 30 uh, let me get that, 34. Now, this, look at what Jesus says. He lays it out in the Beatitudes. He says, But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shall thou swear by the head, because thou cannot make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, 
for whatever, whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. He's calling it evil. When you get into bearing or, or using this name in vain by declaring things, when you get into lying, it is evil. It's evil. You have just destroyed your credibility if you're caught in a lie. You can have said a lot of truth down the line, but if anybody catches you in a lie, you have just lost your credibility, and from that point on, they'll think you're like the guy that, call, that cries wolf. They can't believe whatever you say. Now, I want you to look at something else, because this is very important. Matthew 12, just go over a couple of chapters of Matthew 12. We're going to look at something else, he says. This is found in 36. It says, But I say unto you that every idle, idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof on, in the day of judgment. Wow. Every idle word. Boy, I, I can't begin to tell you how many idle words I've said. And I think, Lord, why did I say that was a waste of time and breath, right? Go on to 37. For by thy words thou shalt be justified. In other words, if you are telling the truth, you're going to be justified in everything you say. And it goes on, and by the words thou shalt be condemned. If you're lying, you're going to be condemned by your words. Because it's going to show you to be a liar. So let's go back to uh, Zechariah. Our words should be backed up by godly character, people, or it will fall to the wayside. And godly character involves being faithful. I take you at your word because you're faithful. You're a man or a woman of faith, good faith. I can take it, your word for it. And we don't see that today. We have to have so much paperwork to bind people up to their word. It's just, it's just incredible when in the past it used to be a handshake. That's how far away we've got from the reality of truth. Now, we know that the law of God carries blessings and curses, don't we? Curses are consequences. And if you look at Joshua 8, 30, 35, we're not going to look at that. But it's about the time when Joshua... Uh, they read the law. He had half of the people stand at the foot of Mount Ebal, the other half at Mount Gerizim. And those at Mount Gerizim declared the blessings, and those at Mount Ebal declared the curses. And it was going back and forth like this. Because they wanted them to, wanted them to realize, if you disobey the law, you're coming under a curse. Now, God's not cursing you. You're coming under a curse, okay? If you do what's right, you're coming under the blessings of God. It was that simple. He wanted them to understand that. Now, apparently, there was a lot of stealing and fraud going on. And when you get into stealing, there's a lot more that the domino effects. Because in, if you're stealing from uh, a business and they raise their prices and, and begin to basically steal from you, and it, gets, it goes on and on and on, okay, to try to pay for sin. And Jesus paid for our sin. But we are forever paying for the sins of others in our communities, in our societies, in our homes. We're paying for the sins of others. We're paying for their lies. We're paying for them stealing. We're paying, we're paying. Now, when you use the Lord's name in vain, you're committing a fraud, okay? You're committing a type of fraud. And so we see that people were not being responsible to do right by others. They were taking advantage of things. They were trying to get ahead. They were not people of good faith. And I want you to know if a man steals from somebody... He's probably stealing from God, too. And so as a result of this, a curse was being sent forth. Can you imagine that? A curse. The consequences, the judgment 
was being sent forth. That's what it says. Then said he unto me, this is a curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. It wasn't just there, it was over here, it was over there, okay? It was going over the whole face of the earth. For everyone that stills shall be cut off. Now they don't know if that meant that they were excommunicated or killed. There's indications that they were killed in a lot of incidents. And some, they were just banned. Okay, we don't know what's going on here exactly. On the side according to it, and everyone that swears shall be cut off as on the other side according to it. Now listen to what he says in verse 4. He says, I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts. He's bringing forth this curse. And it shall enter. Now look at this. It shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that swears falsely in my name, and it shall remain in the midst of his house, and it shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. He says they're going to be consumed by this curse. It's going to eat them alive. Now how many of our homes are cursed today? And how many in those homes are being eaten alive? How many of our churches are being cursed today? That's something to think about. You have to realize this is a, a, that a curse sets up an environment where nothing is blessed and everything turns into a type of great weight or burden. And then everything starts just ebbs out. And pretty soon there's nothing left. Now I want you to realize, this is scriptural, judgment begins in the house of God. He is going to begin with his people. He's going to begin with Israel. Okay? Now we know that it begins in the house of God because 1 Peter 4.17 tells us that. Also, you can read Ezekiel 9, 4 through 6, and it talks about the judgment of Jerusalem. You know who they went after? Those Jews. They were judged first. So let's look at verse 5 now. Then said the angel and talked with me and went forth and said, Lift up now thy eyes and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, Well, what is it? And he said, this is an Ephra that goeth forth. The Epa? Yeah, Epa, okay. Well, I looked at a different head like an F sound, but I don't know. That goeth forth. He said, moreover, this is their resemblance through uh, all the earth. And behold, there was a lifting up of a talent and lead, and in this a woman that stirreth in the midst of the Epa. I mean, set. Sit almost, yeah, sit in the midst of it. And he said, This is wickedness. Wow. And he cast it into the midst of the epaw, and he cast the weight of lead up on the mouth thereof. Now, you say, What is all this about? Well, what he's doing is he's binding all the wickedness, and it's represented in what? We're going to look at what it's represented in. And he's going to deal with it. Now, what is the epa? Uh, it is actually considered a bushel. It's a little less than a bushel is what they said. And this is not your regular bushel. This is magnified in order to address the wicked, wickedness. But it's the, what it shows us is that wickedness is measured. And that when it comes to full bloom, then God will judge it. Now the wickedness has come to full bloom. It's been measured as so. And now he's ready to deal with it. Now that should concern us a little bit. Because when we look at America, are we being judged? When we look at some of the churches, are we seeing judgment? When we look at homes, are we seeing judgment? Why? Because God has weighed it. 
And now he has to deal with it because it has come to full bloom. He's got to deal with it. It's time to reap it, to bring forth uh, the, uh, the results of it, I should say. So we're going to look at this a little bit more because, uh, and this uh, talent of weight here of lead is uh, figured to be 20, 75 to 100 pounds. So it's not a minor weight. It is to hold down whatever's in there. Okay? He's going to hold it down. He's going to make sure it's dealt with. It's not going to be able to fly away. It's not going to get it away. So every wicked person out there, I want you to know one day you're going to be judged and you may think you can get away, but God's going to put a weight on you and you will not be able to scramble from underneath it. Now this is a pretty vivid picture, isn't it? He's not, he's not laying it in a nice little diplomatic, political, correct way. He's calling it what it is. So let's look at what it says in uh, verse 9. And it says, and then I lifted up. Now, who is in the middle of this, people? It's a woman. Okay, a woman's in the middle of this. Uh, she represents that wickedness. Now she's trying to get out from underneath it. He puts a lead on it like you're not going to get out from underneath this. You're going to pay the consequences. And then we have two other beings enter. And, and I lifted up my eyes and looked and behold, there came out two women. And the wind was in their wings for they had wing, wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up this, uh, this, this ephah between the earth and and the heaven. So they lifted this up above the earth. They're taking it out just like this. And they are angels, people. They are angels. Now, angels are unisex, unisex according to uh, Matthew 22, 23 through 30. They don't have a gender, okay? But they can take on the appearance of a woman or a man. And these two were taking on the appearance of a woman, and there's wind underneath their wings, which point to the Holy Spirit. God is lifting them up with this uh, weight and everything else because he's going to deal with it. But he's going to set it someplace too. So let's look at where he sets it. Ten. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, where do you bear this? And he said unto me to build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. You know where this place is? It's Babel. It's Babylon. That's where it's located. That's what he's talking about. You can see that in Genesis 10.10. 10. It's back at Babel. It's back at Babylon. And he's going to set it right there in the middle of Babylon. You have to remember some of the Jews were still there and they were caught up with the commercialism of Babylon. Now we know there's lots of prophecies about Babylon. The city of Babylon, what happened to it? But there's also a system of Babylon. It's commercialism of the worst type, okay? Where it's controlling with money because of greed. The root of all evil is what? Money. How many people pursue it, seek it, depend on it, and use it as a means to get power? Well, Babylon's that way. Now, I've heard people say, oh, Babylon's the nation of America. No, it's a city. A city with a lot of power. The Babylon of all was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. It had tremendous power over the whole world as far as money and commercialism and trading. It's a city and it's a, it's a system. Okay? It's also a point of worship. And of course, a lot of people worship money. They worship power. Now it's going to be centered there. Isn't that amazing? 
back in Babylon where all these Jews are. <laughs> They're living the high life. Why these Jews over here are going through some pretty tough times. And, and it's their fault. Some of it's their fault. But to how much encouragement did they have back at, from the house there, back at Babylon, when everybody was living their life? Now, this, this is not over what he's going to be saying here. But it gives you an idea that God is going to take all wickedness, he's going to put it together, and he's going to judge it. Because it stands cursed, no matter what it is. And boy, does our world today need to hear that. Now, we have considered the prophecies about Babylon and what it is. And it would be directed at Babylon. That's what you have to understand. It's directed at the attitude of Babylon, the system of Babylon, the city of Babylon, uh, the commercialism of Babylon, the power of Babylon. It is being directed at that. And it's all because it finds its source in the idol of greed. And the Jewish people, some of them were caught up with the system and the practices of Babylon, and this curse would be directed at them. It would fall on others, but it would be directed at them. Now, as we know, people who get caught up with the idle money often become very stingy and indifferent to the needs of those around. They don't care because it's all about them, right? So he's going to say some things. Now that he has brought out this curse, and oh, that's depressing, he's going to bring out some promises. Because that's how God does it. When he goes to chastise, warn, then he brings out the promises. Because he wants you to have that contrast so you'll make the right decision. Sadly, most of us don't. We don't care. Because you know what? If my life is going okay, my, I'm not poor, I'm not losing anything, my life is okay, why? Why change it? And that's the problem with it. That's why when the curse comes, these people have to lose things so they begin to look up to God and begin to depend. And that's what that curse was. That curse was going to cause them to begin to lose things begin to have their money go out and their power or their wealth, whatever, to ebb away. So let's look at the promises that he gives in verse 6, I mean chapter 6, verse 1. And I turn, we're going we're gonna to be looking, by the way, at, uh, i got to get this right, 1 through 8. And I turned and lift up my eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out, from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. In the first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot black horses, and in the third chariot white horses, and in the fourth chariot grizzle, is that right, and bay horses. Then I answered and said to the angel that talked with me, What are these, my lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. There is that word, that term again, Lord of all the earth, the owner of the earth. The black horses which are thereon go forth into the north country, the white go forth after them, and the girly, girlish, grizzle, sorry, grizzle go forth towards the south country. And the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, get you hands, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. Then cried he upon me and spake unto me, saying, behold, these that go towards the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. Now you say, what in the world is he talking about there? Now, there was a similar uh, vision in chapter 1, only it was more about the army. And the army was sent forth to uh, check on the Gentiles and report on them. So there was a lot of similarities between this one and that one, only they're talking about chariot and horses here, which is a little bit different. We're going to look at what he's talking about here, because what he's talking about 
is that when you get chariots in, involved, they symbolize messengers of God's judgment, patrolling the earth, executing the decrees of God on Israel's enemies. There are four of them, types of them, pointing at universal judgment. So you have these four groups of chariots going forth with different colors of horses. Now, they're going to be sent to the different parts to do God's bidding. Now, chariots of God supposedly make up 20 are made up of 20,000, even thousands of angels. How do I know this? Well, that's what the Bible says. Psalm 68, 17 says, The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in cyanide in the holy place. Now, when you look up that scripture, the Lord is Anai. That's how he's, his name is used in that scripture. The owner again. Now, these angels are being referred to as four spirits. And it also implies, okay, there will be wind involved in them going forth, which is the Holy Spirit. Now, anytime you see chariots, they suggest battles and implies judgment. Now, consider what Isaiah 66, 15 through 16 says. It says, for behold... The Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Now that's, that's pretty major when you look at it. Isaiah, if you want to write that down and see that, Isaiah 66 uh, 15 through 16. It's a real warning. So we see these uh, four chariots coming out from between the two mountains. Now they believe this is Mount Zion and the Mount of Olives. And the reason they believe that is because this is what I understand. Between Mount Zion and Mount of Olives is the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat means Lord judges. And so they are coming between this valley. And notice how it calls the mountains of brass. Brass is always used in relationship to judgment on sin. And so they're coming through this valley and they're being dispersed. Different, horse, different color horses throughout the universal world if you want to call it that. Now, it's very important. They're going out to accomplish God's purpose, okay? And the red horse, they often say, is like a bay horse. I don't know. But what it represents is the power, okay? The power in bringing great empires and nations down. That's what the red horse is. It's the power to bring great nations and empires down which already started. It already started. And I'll tell you why, because of the history that they're making reference to. It started because Babylon, well, Assyria was brought down by Babylon. Babylon was brought down by the Middle Persian Empire. It already started. And guess where they're located? In the north. You have to keep that in mind. They were located in the north. So it already started. And so there was a lot going on. Of course, a black horse associated with defeat, despair, sorrow, famine, death. And they went to the north country where the remnant of Asher, which is Assyria, Babylon, and the Medo Persia was. That's where they were out there. And it went towards them because it's ready to bring judgment. It already has brought judgment, but it's going to bring more judgment. So the white horses that follow behind, that's an interesting thing, they're following behind these red horses. They represent 
joyous victories. You know what's going to follow? A man by the name of Alexander the Great. And he's going to have many victories. And he's going to bring the Mount Persian Empire down. He's going right behind them. Wow, okay. But look at these other horses. They're grizzled horses or piebald horses is what they call. They represent a mixed experience. They're part disaster and part prosperity, which would befall on Egypt, which is what happened to Egypt if you study their history. They are going out towards Egypt you're talking about a lot of different history here. Because if you know about Egypt, Babylon came in there. <laughs> you know, Alexander the Great came in there. I mean, they, and it was a very rich country. But then these other countries would come in. And they would take them slaves and they would cause them to pay taxes and all these things. So they would have times of great prosperity and times of great, uh, you know, leanness depending on who was ruling over them. It's all there in scripture. So can you imagine, here's Zechariah seeing the history, sort of. He's looking over here a little bit, already knows, but he's looking down the line. And he's, tell, he's, going to, he's telling them what's going to happen. Now, they're told also, we see that the bay were told to go walk to and fro through the earth, throughout the earth to see exactly what was happening, taking, taking records, taking notes, okay, so to speak, to make sure everything was where it was, falling into place, or what was going on. So you have those happening too. Now, look at this. This is very important. Then cried he unto me, and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go towards the north. Notice the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. What is he saying? He says, what I have called forth has already been done. Therefore, my wrath is at rest. That's what he was saying. My wrath is at rest. It is not ceased. It's laying there at rest until the next, the next judgment comes. But the north, it's gone as far as it's going to go right now. So I'm at rest with that. Now that's quite a picture, isn't it? You're like, wow, okay, that's quite a history lesson there. Because we can look back and see it actually happen. But people, it's pointing forward because look at the four horses in Revelation. Same horses. It means what? Power to bring down all nations and empires. It means famine, judgment, through sword and death. We see it in Revelation. We've already seen it here in, in Zechariah. It's laying out a picture for us. And I have a feeling those horses are going to go in the areas, the same areas, the red to the north. What's to the north? The, no, the red to the north, isn't it? And the black is to the north? Well, to the north of Israel, you have to think of Israel, is Russia. Turkey. What nations are trying to climb on top? We're seeing the same thing today. It's all being stirred up. And his wrath is rusting right now. But there's going to be a great day called the Battle of Armageddon where his wrath is going to be poured out. And no one's going to be left standing. It's coming. And you see God putting the hooks in the mouth of these leaders to pull them towards that judgment. 
You can watch it. We're watching all these prophecies coming true today, aren't we? And yet we're in the ark. His name is Christ. And we will be spared from his wrath to come. And I hope whoever hears this that they are in the, in the ark and will be spared the wrath to come because it's coming. God is a just God. So let's look at this, and I'll probably slaughter some of these words. But And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, this is another vision he's given. Take of them of the captivity, even of Heldei, of Tob, Toba, uh, Toba, Tobi, Tobi, oh, Tobi, Bijah, thank you. And Zedadiah, Zedadiah, now I can't even pronounce that, Zedadiah, which are come from Babylon. Now notice they all come from Babylon and come now the day, the same day and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, and take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua. Okay, he's the high priest. Uh, and speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. That's very important there. Jesus, and he shall grow up out of this place, meaning Jerusalem, the Holy Land, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his, notice that word, his throne. And he shall be priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. This is the, the reign of the Messiah. Now, this is strange because... Joshua could not really be king. You see, they had a problem. The king came from Judah and, jo and, and the priest from Levi, and they couldn't bring the two together. So as long as they were separated, they could not have a king that could be a priest and a priest that could be a king. The only way God could solve that is bring up a seed out of David that could wear the throne, but he would have to have the high priest, he would, be of, he would have to be of the Melchizedek priesthood. And the Melchizedek priests were chosen by God. They did not come out of a particular lineage like the Levi. And so what he's shown is that down the line, there will be a man that will be the king. He will be the priest. He will sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem, and he will rule. And Joshua, the crowning of Joshua, was to be a shadow of that. And he says the one that will is the man whose name is the branch, Jesus Then he says he's going to build the temple. Now there's manifest sons of God running out there. We're going to bring Jesus back. We're going to straighten this world up. Well, how's, how's that working for you? Jesus has to come back to save the world. He has to come back to straighten out the world. And he's the one that's going to build his temple. Now, do I understand all of this? No, I just know he's going to build his temple. Everybody's waiting for a temple to be built. I'm not sure a temple's going to be built. I think a tabernacle's going to be erected. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to build a temple. Why? Because it says he's going to build the last temple. It's not man that's going to build the last temple. Now, they could build a temple, but I would say it's probably going to get destroyed. <laughs> Okay? And as far as I know, there's only going to be three major temples. Maybe four. But I don't know if they count the Herod's temple because it wasn't really built by the Jews. I think they count the temple 
of, of Solomon, the temple that they need to build, and then the third and final temple will be built by Jesus. So I don't know if they even count Herod's temple. Because like I said, he, he, he was not a Jew. But I don't know. That's just my opinion. Don't say, thus saith the Lord. Rahel said, thus saith the Lord, because I'm not saying that at all. That's just my opinion, okay? So this is all very prophetic. This is about the rain that's yet to come. We are watching God bring it all into place. And then if you look at 14, he's going to take these crowns and look at the very bottom for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. When the Lord... It was going to be a temple, in the, I mean a memorial in the temple to remind people that one day you're going to have a priest and you're going to have a king who's going to be one man, he's going to rule. That was the memorial he set up in the temple. So was there going to be a temple? You bet there was going to be a temple <laughs> because they're going to have that crown sitting there as a memorial. And now look at what he says about the temple that they have to build. Because this is to them. He says, and they that are far off, this is 15, shall come and build in the temple of the Lord. He says, those who are far off, he's, he's not talking about these pagans, he's talking about Jewish. Those who are far off are going to come and build in the temple of the Lord, and he shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. In other words, Zechariah says, he, you're going to know that I am the prophet sent by God because you're going to see this happen. You're going to see this happen. But here's the condition. And this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey, obey the voice of the Lord your God. That's conditional, people. So Zechariah is looking forward, isn't he? He's looking forward historically. He's looking forward as far as spiritual. He's looking forward. And he is seeing what we're waiting for. Now they said this happened 1,900 years before Christ came. But it was prophesied 2,500 years well, actually, they began to be dispersed 2,500 years. They began to hear these prophecies. They were going to be dispersed, and they were going to be sent forth, and they were going to be scattered. So this is 1,900 years before the fact. And he's looking down almost 4,000 years. Pretty amazing. So he's looking back at historical events only to look forward to what is yet to come. The Jewish people could only build the present temple in light of the future reign of their Messiah, who would be both king and priest. And they had a crown. They would have a crown in the temple to remind them. And of course, he would reign upon the throne of David and the man whose name is a branch, he would grow out of the place of the Holy Land to die on the cross while looking forward to an eternal kingdom that will never cease. What a beautiful picture, isn't it? Here's all this judgment, historically wise, but yet here's this glorious future looking forward to the Messiah. We have so much to be thankful for. Even though I'm not excited about the days I'm living in, I'm excited about what I'm seeing because I can tell you the Bible is true. <laughs>